Fernandez Amesto begins his account of the highland civilizations, the civilizations set high in the mountains, where we're on a plateau or steep slopes, with a quote from the English 18th century uh, author Samuel Johnson, the famous Dr. Johnson, who wrote an early dictionary of English. And it's a quote from his travel story of a journey to the Western Isles of Scotland. And he says, as mountaineers, by which he means people who live in mountains, not mountain climbers, as mountaineers are long before they are conquered, they are likewise long before they are civilized. And this quote really uh, represents a pretty common uh, stereotype, I guess, of uh, certainly the Scottish Highlanders as being, or you see uh, repetitions of this relatively uncivilized stereotype uh, from others in the way in which many Americans would discuss the Afghani tribes people in their uh, highland fastnesses. So it's a pretty common stereotype of the highland civilizations being uh, madly defensive, neurotically neurotic about their security and isolated and rather uh, lacking in the uh, luxuries and uh, whatnot of civilized life down in the lowlands. But this is very much not a, is very much a cliche and one that, of course, Fernandez Amesto helps us get beyond. Among the highland civilizations that are described by Fernandez Amesto are New Guinea, Zimbabwe, Ethiopia, Iran, Tibet, and of course, Mesoamerica, Mexico, and the Andes, the Aztecs, and the Incas. And he really uh, identifies, I guess, three broad characteristics of these environments in their interaction with the civilization. First of all, I the thing about highlands is there's lowlands below. And so to some degree, the highlands civilizations are very much defined partly by their relationship with the lowlands civilization down below. And that is not necessarily a relationship of iso isolation or vulnerability. Sometimes the highland civilization is the dominant one uh, in terms of power and economy and uh, exploits and has a lot of, uh, makes a lot of use of the lowland civilizations, or lowland cultures, let's call them. The second thing is, well, you know, it's a lot more, there's a lot of security and defensibility about the positions in a mountain. So there is not a sense of impregnability, but a strong a sense of the security of some of these civilizations. And finally, the third big thing, and this is something that given my rather poor knowledge of uh, the science of geography, I didn't really know before reading Felipe Fernandez Mesto's book, is as you climb the slopes of the uh, highlands, it gives it means there are lots of different little climates along the way and lots of little ecological niches so that as you uh, travel a relatively short distance you can actually encounter enormous diversity of resources and plant products and animal products, weather and uh, sort of ecological niches. So this is quite sustaining for many of these highland civilizations. I guess perhaps amongst the most famous of highland civilizations really are the Aztecs and the, um, the Incas of uh, Mesoamerica and the Andes. And these two are broadly in different kinds of geographical setups. Mesoamerica is much more of a I think this is right. I think Mesoamerica is more of a high plateau, whereas the Andes are sort of more a long, sloped, narrow strip with great 
uh, diversity, but quite a lot of uh, slope along the way. And this, to some degree, also shaped some of their different character and uh, qualities. Both the Aztecs and the Incas, which were both around when, you know, the Spanish conquistadors arrived uh, from uh, around about 1500 on, were actually relatively recent cultures, societies, civilizations. The Aztecs were a particularly aggressive sort of conquest state, uh, and the Incas had built a rather impressive centralized sort of empire in the Andes. But they were both uh, surrounded by ruined predecessor cultures. There had been multiple attempts before to found civilization or to build civilizations in these environments, some of which were magnificently successful and are described in uh, Fernandez and Mesto's book, but all of which also ended up in ruin. And both the, the uh, military aggressiveness, I guess, of the Aztec state and the centralizing power of the Inca state created a lot of internal strife that was a contributing factor like, to to weakness of those uh, societies encounter with the conquistadors but it's really uh, the Incas perhaps that most impressed Fernandez Amisto in some ways and that's partly because he says they were the most successful in civilizing if you look at all all around the world in the early 16th century, the, he described the Inca Empire as the most successful in civilizing the largest range of environments of any place on earth. So Fernandez de Mesto says that the Andes form a long thin chain. The Inca Empire stretched along them over more than 30 degrees of latitude from east to west across their peaks rainfall and cloud cover are contorted into extremes of difference. The steepness of the mountains means that a great diversity of environments can be found concentrated in a small space. Between sea and snow, different echo zones are stacked as if in, a, as if in tiers, T-I-E-R-S. The Puna grasslands, which occupy altitudes of between about 12,000 and 15,000 feet are broken up by intense patches of cultivable soils wherever the subsoils retain heat or moisture. And these grasses also, unlike in the Mexican uh, area, supported the famous, I guess, South American domesticated animals, the llama, the alpaca and the vicuna. The valleys in this area also tend to have less quality rainfall, so it's less likely for those societies to organise irrigation. And the valley structure makes for an extraordinary range of microclimates and specialised biota to supplement the universal diet of potatoes, maize, beans, chilies, peanuts and sweet potatoes. Fernandez Mesta also has just a couple of observations on the nature of the worldview and how that differed bet very much between uh, the Incas and the Aztecs. He says of the Aztecs that the world vision reflected in Inca art is painfully, uncompromisingly abstract. Human and animal forms are spatchcocked and straightened by way weavers and goldsmiths. An unyielding imagination is embodied in crushing architecture, the exactly dressed masonry in gigantic slabs, the unflinching symmetry, the exclusion of any bending or bowing or any gesture imitated from nature. There is less naturalistic art among the Inca than in Islam. Of course, Inca also had a form of knotted writing, which may have carried stories, but no one has ever been able to work that out. There was a fair bit of terror and a fair bit of human sacrifice in the Inca system as well. And I feel at some point I must 
do a special episode on either both, maybe even both the Incas and the Aztecs because they're they're fascinating cultures that I'd like to know more about. And I always remember Inga Clendinen, who was a historian at Melbourne Uni, wrote a marvellous, marvellous book about the Aztecs. So I think I might return to that on another episode. But for now, I think we'll just mention that both the Inca and the Aztec resisted to some degree, and the Inca for quite a long time, well into the 16th century and beyond, and their cultural memory is increasingly significant, uh, or has been very, very significant to the various Latin American and Central American states of today. It would be interesting actually to just think about the use of some of these, let's call them unconventionally honoured civilizations in modern geopolitics. I've thought for another day perhaps. <laughs> 